So let's talk about best practices and how much I love them. Um, my name is Enrique. I'm a principal DevOps engineer at Darwin at uh, DLG. So Darwin is kind of a secret thing that no one knows about. It's basically, uh, we're build, DLG is building a new insurance company based around uh, machine learning and new processes like containers and cloud because it's very, very new. Um, I'm overall a huge GNU Linux nerd, and you know that because I use GNU Linux. Uh, Even and though you're Sorry? Even though you're at Darwin. Yes. Ah, good one. Uh, <laughs> so this technically makes me an insure salesman, and as an insure salesman, I can tell you we're actually doing the right thing. Believe me on that. And that's my email if you want to message me. Uh, right, so uh, we should first we should define what the best practice is. So I went to Wikipedia and I got that one. I mean, it's not bad, but um, I prefer my definition. So, and, and I, I hate those words so much that I actually made a talk about it. Uh, there is this guy, though, and I think he hit the nail on the head. Uh, so basically, it, it's a tried and tested practice that consistently enhances performance. And I think this is the one that actually defines what the best practice is because it has a justification. And there are some metrics because you have to have some metrics to define that. So this talk shouldn't really exist because as we all know, there are some uh, the best tool for the job and all of that. Um, but the best practices are very subjective. They all depend on the context. So something that uh, you can apply to a certain company, you cannot apply to the other. And uh, some situations require you to think a little bit outside the box to find the, the right solution. And as someone pointed out, that is actually a dogma, saying that dogmas don't belong in an engineer's toolkit. So let's implement all the best practices. Uh, these are just some examples. I mean, I'm not saying that these are good things or these are bad things. So once again, it all depends on the context. So keep an open mind. So we'll start with the first one. Um, waterfall was a best practice. Right, everyone can agree on that. Everyone was doing waterfall. That's the thing that people know about. So Agile came along and people started writing books about Scrum and Scrum is awesome. And all um, uh, CIS admins in the house here, they all love Scrum, right? It's amazing for the stuff that we do. <laughs> and what I really like about Agile is we have those ceremonies and, and we're so agile that we have to follow them in a very strict and controlled way because that's how things go. That's how you become agile, just following the rules. So in reality, uh, agile, you can pick, pick and choose what works for you. So you try some things. Some of them work, some of them don't work. Uh, this is actually a lesson that I learned from a scrum master a couple of years ago that he simply, uh, he was managing our DevOps team and he just said, I am a Scrum Master, but I know that Scrum does not work for you. So let's, let's find something else. I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you what processes you're going to follow. I'm going to help you defining your own process. And that was a life lesson. And I mean, maybe Scrum is the best for you. But you, you have to figure that out for yourselves. So the second one is you should have one repo for every piece of code that you have. That's the best practice. And you have a clear separation between projects. No interference. Or you can have a mono repo, a single repo for all the projects. I mean, this is you can have something in between, right? But there are some big companies working on this, 
And I say big companies because it's actually really hard to work with monorepos. So all these companies have their own tools. Uh, as far as I know, there isn't a real standardization between them, so they're still trying to figure out some challenges. If you have, if your code repo is a couple of hundred terabytes, then maybe you can't download that on your laptop. But it, it is thinking outside the box, and it works for them. And one thing that I really like and you can apply this to some other projects as well, you don't need to do the whole thing, is you can have atomic commits between different projects. So sometimes when you're reviewing code, people send you, oh, here are three merge requests, and they're all related. Oh, why did you do this? Oh, you have to take a look at the other merge request to understand. While here, you have one merge request that encompasses everything you want to do in an atomic fashion. Containers, great. So back in the day, you used to have multiple applications running in a single server, and that was the best practice. But then someone came along and said, no, you should have, now you have virtual machines. You can create many virtual machines, you run one application, Per, um, per virtual machine, and that is now the best practice. And then someone came along and said, well, yes, but you, you should now use configuration management instead of just going inside the server and doing things. And someone said along, no, you should not use configuration management, you should use immutable containers, and that is now the best practice. And all the mainframe people and BSG, uh, uh, BSC jail guys are now laughing because they've been doing this kind of stuff for years now. Um, and then serverless guys come along and say, hold my beer. <laughs> because nothing applies anymore. Now you don't even have servers. So how do, we, how do we go from here? Well, in reality, everything here can be some sort of best practice. You can have VMs. You can have containers. It depends on the context that you want to do. Um, for example, there's an application that I'm running that cannot, run in a, cannot be run in a container. It needs to be run in a VM. Is that wrong? No, it's just the way it is. And I can tell you what that is. It's, it's a secret, remember. It's very secret. Code monoliths. We all of them. They're great. Are they? Well, they're bad. It says there, right there. It says it's bad. It's very bad. We should use them. We should all move to microservices. Well, really, there is a reason why monoliths exist. A lot of companies were built using monoliths because that's the stuff that worked. If they spend all their time trying to uh, do a distributed system, then maybe they went bankrupt before they got their funding. And we should not confuse microservices with a distributed architecture, because you can have a distributed architecture with a monolith. It's just an implementation detail that you want, another pattern. So I'm not really advocating for code monoliths, don't get me wrong, but there is a case for them. Configuration management is something that I hold dear to my heart. Um, Terraform. For, you, you can use that for orchestration, and then you can use Ansible for configuration management, uh, and you reuse everything that someone else has built, and everything works fine, and everyone, whoever uh, used Ansible Galaxy knows that everything is perfect there, and they're, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, no, seriously. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> I hate Terraform with a passion. Um, when I started writing Terraform, I was 15, and that was last year. I, I, I grew old. And I'm actually very biased towards Ansible. I don't know if you've noticed that. Ansible does everything you need. It does orchestration. It does configuration management. I know it has its limitations. So a former colleague of mine once said that, um, and I love this, Ansible is a collection of bugs glued together with Python. He's not wrong. <laughs> and when you have 
all those things, when you're building your infrastructure, no two infrastructures are the same. So your business needs one thing, my business needs another thing. If I build something for my business and I shove it into, um, into public repo, it's probably not going to work for you. The tags are going to be different. The something, user management is going to be different. Y you're not going to be able to use it verbatim. So the best for you to do, Dogma, by the way, is to just take a look at it, see how people done their things, and reuse it for your own purposes. So I, honestly, I was never able to reuse something um, for, from configuration management of the internet, either Puppet or Ansible or Terraform. And all the stuff that I actually did from Terraform, I, I threw it away eventually, because it just wouldn't work. So this leads me to my next point, which is uh, the don't repeat yourself pattern of writing code. You should never repeat yourself. You should always uh, uh, make everything uh, reusable on your configuration. This is a great tweet that somebody sent me a while ago. And basically, in a nutshell, it says that if, if you keep this, if you, you, if you use uh, dry as a dogma, you can have a lot of problems because not writing things twice is not, it wasn't the ultimate goal. So I'm actually going to read, uh, if you go to this tweet and go a little bit down, whoops, come on, <coughs> can do it. Um, it basically says, strive for a single source of truth in your data model and business logic. It doesn't say anything about writing code twice or three times or four times. There are some, uh, sometimes you have to write a code twice. Uh, these, and I, once again, I'm gonna read, these two things do the same thing and these two things should always do the same thing. It, it's not the same. So you have to know when to reuse code and when not to. Because otherwise you're gonna end up doing things like, oh, somebody did this, now I have to break it apart now. This is my favorite topic. It's work priority. You know, you have your Kanban boards and your Jiras with your Scrum. You prioritize all your work, and then you work on the, uh, the, the most important thing. Because the most important thing, it's, you know, the most important thing. But who actually defines what is the most important thing? Because business doesn't really care about um, tech debt, right? They want you to go produce more features and more features, and then you, you, you need time to clean up your code. You need time to find better solutions, better alternatives, right? If you're using um, AWS, for example, you subscribe to their blog, there's always new fun stuff coming along, right? I was uh, just this weekend, this past weekend, I was looking into it. I said, oh, they just released something new that I can reuse, now you can use uh, secrets in your um, ECS task definition instead of just using uh, parameter star. Great, it's a very small change, but it means I can delete other lines of code, so just do it. But that's, that's not a priority for the business. Business will look at that and say, this is not priority. You should not work on this. You should let your code beat rot. And then there's no one else left to manage it, and then the whole business goes down the drain which is not what I want because they pay my salary. Another very important thing is hackathons. They're not a waste of time. So in a previous company that I was in, uh, we had regular hackathons. We actually had one hackathon per month, one day, but then we decided to switch and do every two months, we have one hackathon of two days. So usually if you've been in hackathons, you know that the first three quarters of the time you're spending setting up the environment, and then you spend the last quarter trying to do a presentation on how you did na nothing, actually. <laughs> so if you move to a two-day model, uh, you actually can get things done. So as an example, we actually implemented 
uh, a CD pipeline in a hackathon, which was invaluable. And me as a sysadmin, I was like really scared of that. But it works fine. It works absolutely fine. It was brilliant. And then uh, another thing that came out of hackathons was uh, containers. We're actually one of the first companies that were using containers in production very early on. Uh, actually presented at uh, DevOps Exchange a couple of years ago talking about that. And it was super great. So definitely not a waste of time. So I don't have more examples right now. Um, but some of the things that I, I could talk about were um, uh, QWERTY keyboards, for example, because QWERTY keyboards are not designed to help you type uh, faster. It's just the other way around. Uh, you can fact check that. Now, on the second part, so the first bit was just show you, showing you that there are just if someone says this is a best practice, does it actually make it a best practice? The second bit is, which is a lot smaller, is simply to say that sometimes if something is a best practice and it's been proven by other companies and they have papers describing it as a best practice, it, doesn't, it may not work for you. I hate the word value, by the way. That's why I always use that uh, weird font. My whole thing is about change. You should enable change because change is the only thing that makes you go forward. In business terms, add value. Um, but we don't want to do it in a hackish way. We want to do it in a sustainable way. Thus, best practices. But the cost of implementing best practices might outweigh the benefits. So there's this... Um, I have the sources in, in the end, but there's this uh, story that I, that I like about a guy who came to a company and said, Six Sigma is the best practice. So he went on, he implemented Six Sigma, huge success, great. And when he left, the guy who came over and said, it's actually crap because, for us, because uh, our whole deal is R&D and innovation. And Six Sigma does not allow for innovation and for R&D. So they had to change the whole thing around. But Six Sigma is best practice, not just for, for, uh, for them. And I like that sentence a lot. Be aware of the person with a single KPI. So that guy had a single KPI, maybe, probably not, that said, we need to reduce defects. And he did reduce defects. He got a huge bonus, but the company Eh, not so much. So we have to understand, when we're talking about best practices, we have to understand what we're talking about. We have to understand the consequences of implementing them. Th these are the downs. We have, have the ups. They're nicer. So remember that uh, uh, phrase from Jerome? So it's, it's tried, and it's tested, and it consistently enhances performance. It's not just something that might give it a boost sometimes. You have, to, it, you have to have metrics to prove that it works for you. You have to justify operational change. Uh, it's, it, it's not the best thing ever. It's just something that works for you. And you don't have to do everything in a, in a single go. You can do it incrementally. And when, uh, an example that I like is a lot of people think that to move to a container world, they have to change their entire infrastructure. They have to change the entirety of the way they do things. They have to change CI, CD. They have, to, uh, they have now to run Kubernetes. But that's not true. If your business runs one application per VM, for example, which is fairly common, you can still run that application inside the container. And you can even start the container just to docker run, etc., in systemd or whatever um, in it is your preference. The whole thing still works. You can still have your uh, encapsulated environment. Your developers can take advantage of that to build their things, to test their things. You don't need to do everything in, one, in a single go. Sometimes it's just OK to do small changes. It's still change. 
So it's still value that you're adding. Now, as closing thoughts, best practices do change over time. They have a shelf life. So might as well not consider that best practice to be the one and only thing you'll ever need. That will change. So you need to keep reevaluating what you, what you do, keep reevaluating your goals, and move accordingly. Um, once again, keep an open mind, because some of the things that, uh, like all the innovation, it was just because someone said, never thought of that, right? So when people talk about anti-patterns, it's, it's not really an anti-pattern that doesn't exist. What exists is a, a pattern that people are not used to. But it is a pattern nonetheless. And it might work for you just fine. So once again, this, this, this talk shouldn't exist. But um, I think people need a refresher from, from time to time. And these are uh, some of the sources that I have, I was, the la no, yeah, the last one and the second to last one, they're really great. You should take a look at that. <laughs> and that's, that's it.